Return on India is the latest release in the Colossus family of podcasts. For full transcripts and more supporting materials, make sure to check out joincolossus.com. There you will find the full library of content from Colossus shows like Invest Like the Best, Business Breakdowns, Web3 Breakdowns, Founders, 50X, and now Return on India. If you'd like to stay up to date on all announcements for Return on India and other Colossus shows, make sure to sign up for the weekly newsletter again on joincolossus.com. Now on to the show. Welcome to Return on India, a deep dive series covering one of the most populous and promising economies in the world. Through conversations with central figures in Indian business, Return on India will unpack the details that matter for investors and operators. We will examine the unique cultural dynamics behind emerging demographic trends, and we will drill into key sectors by talking to the business leaders driving change. We plan to investigate the past, present, and future as we explore India's investment case. To find more episodes, transcripts, and a library of content to continue your learning, visit joincolossus.com. All opinions expressed by hosts and podcast guests are solely their own opinions. Hosts, podcast guests, their employers or affiliates may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. My guest today is Nitish Mithar Singh, founder and CEO of Nazara. One of the longest standing and most exciting consumer businesses today in India is gaming. The ecosystem is ripe with venture capital. Over $2 billion has been infused in the last few years, developer talent, and an influx of customers with the rise of Geo. But the gaming story has been around for the last 25 years, and Nazar has been a participant since the beginning. I enjoyed getting Nitish's perspective on the industry at large, how it's evolved, and why now is the inflection point for India to make an impact at a global level. From a business model that originally planned for 6 million mobile users at its peak, to one of India's successful consumer IPOs with an aspiration to build a multi-billion dollar revenue business over the coming decade, the Nazara story is filled with lessons applicable for anyone looking to understand the Indian startup ecosystem. Please enjoy my conversation with Nitish Mithar Singh. Nitish, welcome. Thanks so much for joining me. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for calling me. Excited today to talk about one of the most interesting emerging consumer behaviors in India, which is gaming. We're going to go deep into the gaming sector and some of the dynamics that have really put it in a position to explode in India in the coming years. But I want to start with the early days of Nazara first, because you've been in this game for a long time, right? Nazara has been in the journey of gaming since 1999. So give us a perspective just on how different things were back in India about 20 years ago, especially for the gaming sector versus today. Yeah, it was a completely different world. When I started the company, I was still in college starting here in Mumbai. And I just had a dream that gaming will become large in India someday. I didn't realize I was at least a decade too early. In hindsight, it sometimes feels foolish that I started so early. But nevertheless, I still remember the early 2000s, right? 2002, 2003, we were starting to experiment a bit on the mobile side because monetizing online was very difficult. It was a very small user base. but Users were starting to get your Nokia data phones, etc. And some data was starting to come into the system 2003, 2004. I still remember this number of 6 million mobile phone subscribers in India when we were creating a business case of J2ME or Java game downloads. So I still remember playing with Excel and 6 million. That time sounded fairly large. That number still stuck to me. But otherwise, in the landscape, mobile phone data was not activated over the air. Speeds were low. It was very patchy. There was no proper digital payments ecosystem, of course. And you had no VC money flowing. So you were most of the times on your own, especially coming off the 2000.com crash. Those were the early years I remember the Indian landscape. Yeah, and the early business model for the company was something called VAS, Value Added Services effectively partnering with telcos for their distribution and then providing them with original branded content. Talk a little bit more about the value chain at that point. You pointed out some of the staggering stats. I mean, believing that there were 6 million mobile phones and thinking that was as large of an opportunity. It's amazing to see how far, obviously, things have come. Talk a little bit more about the value chain of the industry at that point and why VAST was the appropriate business model to select. 
We started off as an online casual gaming site on the internet, not even mobile or VAS. But we realized that monetizing through advertising was very difficult. And the only way we could monetize was through micropayments from the consumer. But at the same time, collecting 5 rupees or 10 rupees from the consumer digitally really didn't exist, right? There was no real platform to do that, except for what we figured was a mobile phone operator because they had access to the last mile to the consumer and you could collect micropayments through the mobile phone bill or through the prepaid bill. So to us, in terms of monetization, that seemed the only real way to monetize gaming in India. We kick-started that in 2003-2004, when we partnered with Airtel and many of the other you know, telcos in India. And that took off very well for us. We then expanded that to many geographies, I think over 50 countries, largely in the emerging markets. And have run that business for many years quite successfully. Of course, it evolved, right? Because uh, smartphones came in, games were easily downloadable for free. So the curated games library we were running on the telcos became a little less relevant, especially in markets where it evolved. So we still run that business in a few emerging markets. But yeah, that was how we really got started. So let's double click into that, right? Because an interesting dynamic happens when Geo comes into the picture. We're fast forwarding a little bit, but I think Geo is what in many ways you're alluding to of what changes that business model. And on one hand, there's a massive tailwind with low cost of data. So number of users, dissemination of gaming at a higher bandwidth comes through, which is great. It expands the market. On the other hand, though, it has a huge effect on the historical business model and how you monetize. We've talked on this series with other founders about how Geo has affected their business. I think your business is unique because it started pre-Geo. So there was a historical business model. And so Geo wasn't just all tailwinds like it has been for many more recent Indian consumer businesses. So talk a little bit more about the Geo effect specifically for gaming and then how it impacted Nazara and really actually forced the business to evolve. Geo came in and quite disrupted the existing way content business was happening to the mobile operators because they started offering all the content, including gaming for free for the first year or two. Even after that, they were selling bundled packs where you could access content for free. And that put tremendous pressure on the other telcos to be able to charge for the content that Geo had started giving for free. So that very quickly escalated in us finding challenges to monetize the vast business model in India. That was a negative impact that Geo had for us specifically. That said, I think in the larger picture, of course, just making data so accessible, more reliable, and corresponding pressure put on all the other telcos uplifted that entire industry, positively impacted all digital businesses in India, broadly in terms of consumer access and ease of use. If I were to look in retrospective, it's been an extremely positive impact for Nazara and will continue to have a large impact going forward. So in retrospective, yeah, we, we're very happy with what happened then. Let's talk about the gaming market today. With the impact of something like Geo, it's one of the fastest growing consumer markets in India. Most of the funding, which I'll put a pin in because Nazara is interesting also from the perspective that it was a bootstrap story. So definitely want to come back to that at some point and how you guys really accelerated the business without venture funding. But most of the funding that's come into the space a couple billion dollars, has really just been over the past few years. So help us understand the space a little bit better. What's the size? What's the growth rate? What are some of the key dynamics that if someone was trying to understand gaming in India, you would tell them? Sure. So it's important to understand that India, before the mobile explosion happened, really wasn't a gaming market because the devices weren't really there at homes, whether they were PCs or consoles. There were really limited access to that. In colleges, like in my college, my friends would spend a lot of time hanging out, trying to play games on the computers in the college because they didn't have access to it at home. Mobile phones had brought this to everybody. And especially with the advent of lower cost Android smartphones, that everybody in India could start playing games across demographics, right? And that's seen a huge uptake over the last decade or so. I think today, 400, 500 million active users on gaming. And I see it across the demographics. Kids of two years are playing games. My grandmother, who's now touching 90, is still playing games on a mobile phone, board games that she loves. So it really cuts across demographics. Still, I find a lot of people having this mindset that it's young kids or it's boys in the age of 15 to 25 who are playing games. But if you see in India, it's across the board. 
and across all classes of society, all demographics. So it's really popular. The challenge in India has always been that because gaming was not a culture before the smartphone days, unlike, let's say, the Western markets or the Eastern markets, where MMORPGs and all were quite prevalent, people were used to playing all these games on PCs. Like if you go to China, you had these huge cyber cafes, thousands of PCs where people would spend a lot of time. All of that didn't really exist in India. And so people came straight to the mobile, started playing games, started off with very casual approach to gaming. It was very snacky, time pass kind of activity. Therefore, India's mobile first, hyper casual gaming market and therefore monetizes very differently than what other markets have done in the past. So I think it's a market that's evolving. We are still seeing gamers move from hyper-casual to casual to mid-core to now esports suddenly becoming very popular. But I also think that over the last few years, especially with the advent of smartphones that are pretty powerful gaming devices, today a $100 device also, right, is a, a standalone or very powerful gaming device. That digital divide has been bridged and now India is starting to leapfrog quite ahead. I think monetization in India will pick up very fast in the coming years. And I think in certain segments like esports, India has the opportunity and potential to actually leapfrog and become a leader globally. We're seeing a lot of innovation happen within our companies as well as in the market in general around esports. And I think India will catch up very fast. The other aspect of Indian gaming market, which is interesting and to that extent quite specific to our market, is a real scale-up of what is called skill-based real money gaming. So while your casual gaming or your freemium in-app purchases haven't scaled, the skill-based real money gaming business, which comprises of whether it's fantasy sports, other games of skill, that particular business monetized big time and has scaled big time over the last uh, decade or so. So Indian consumers are willing to pay. It really depends on what incentives are driving them. And I think it's a fast evolving market, but I'm quite confident, even though we don't feature in a top 10 by monetization market today, we will catch up in those ranks over the next three to five years. One of the framings I've heard about the sector that resonates, at least outside in, is gaming in India is basically what China was 10 years ago. So I want you to unpack that analogy a little bit more. Where does that resonate and where does that analogy break? Where it resonates, obviously, population. We have a large population, a young population, one market where you can access a billion consumers. China has always been seen as a very large market as well. But like I spoke earlier, where the disconnect is, is the background in terms of how these gamers have evolved. China evolution was into gaming culturally much before the mobile revolution happened. And in India, it's really taken off in the last decade. So culturally, the Indian gamer, I would say, has been quite different than the Chinese gamer. And that kind of reflects in the monetization. Historically, there has been low propensity to spend in India. This is changing now. Again, like I said, we are probably at an inflection point. So let's talk a little bit more about monetization because you've alluded to it a couple of times. For context, India, especially on the consumer business side, is enamoring for outside investors, typically because of headline numbers. Population is very large. And so it's known as a Dalmau factory but one that's notoriously difficult to monetize, right? You have to find where is the actual ARPU looking at these digital consumer businesses. You guys have leveraged a pretty interesting pricing model, Sachet pricing, to actually monetize effectively. It's a model that's widely applicable, I think, to understanding the Indian market across sectors, but you guys have leveraged it interestingly in gaming. Maybe you can explain that concept of Sachet pricing and how it's used in gaming. And then we can double click also into the point that you were just making, which is, the idea of monetization generally is starting to change in India, right? So maybe you can help us understand what's driving that um, and um, and how is that evolution panning out? For gaming, let's take subscription as an example for an app, right? Uh, we may charge $10 a month in the US, but for the same product, we may charge three rupees a day in India. That's the sachet pricing that you're talking about. And we basically have to bet that volumes will make up for the lower entry points that we are offering to the consumers. Because if we don't come in and don't try these services and we don't provide price hooks that allow them to do that easily, then you're not going to really move the needle at all. That's the approach we have taken and it seems to be doing well. I mean, it's still nowhere close to the kind of conversion rates we get in the US for the similar products, but it's getting better. 
what's driving the change other than sachet pricing, for example? What's driving this change in willingness to pay with the Indian consumer? Why is monetization, why is ARPU actually starting to come in where historically it would just be a down out situation? I think the reason for improvements in monetization, even if there are baby steps, is one, more locally relevant content. While some of the international games have done extremely well, and even today monetize the best in India because of inherent game design ability to develop games that are better monetizable, you know, design the game balancing economies done better. But in India, I think developers are starting to really focus on that aspect and really focus on how they can monetize through in-app purchases, how can they design the game that helps in that because everyone's realizing that just building revenues on ad monetization and brand support is not really scalable beyond a point. You have to generate revenues through in-app purchases or subscription. So I think one is better game design overlapped with locally relevant content is helping and will going forward really accelerate the advent of better monetization in India. I think the second aspect is really much more evolved digital payments ecosystem because today even Google Play, et cetera, connect you to UPI. All of India is paying digitally and therefore microtransactions can be collected far more easily. And I think that's one big positive that India is really, as you would know, leapfrogged ahead in terms of digital payments globally, I would say. Every small vendor is you know, accepting digital payments today. And therefore, consumers are continuously using it all day. So therefore, it lends themselves very easily to also spend on gaming 10 rupees, 20 rupees, 50 rupees using these digital payments. So I think that's a big plus, which is helping us in the market as well. What are other unique characteristics in this market? Outside, and if we're thinking about comparing the Indian market to the Western market or to the Chinese market, and you alluded to this a little bit earlier with the different kind of gamer archetype of India versus China, but what else is uniquely Indian that works. Something we've talked a lot about on this show, certainly with other founders as well, is this idea that building X for Y, building a startup that may have been in the US, like an Uber for India, an Airbnb for India, Twitter for India, et cetera, may have been an archetype for a successful company 5, 10, 15 years ago. But as more of India comes online, that model is not only starting to look less attractive, but candidly, it's failing versus building native startups for native use cases in India. What else is uniquely Indian about the gaming market? First, I would say what is not unique to India. India is a fairly flat market and fairly open market, which means today if you go to, let's say, the App Store or the Google Play in India and look at the top monetizing games, leaving aside a few local breakouts, which have been big successes, largely you will see international games do pretty well over here, especially in the top crossing. Because the Indian consumer is looking first for well-designed games and highly engaging games. There are not that many cultural blocks that will stop them from consuming the international content. Language is also not a great barrier. This means that for local developers to break through, they really have to develop local content that competes with the best that's out there globally. In the last decade, doing that just for the Indian market, investing on local titles that would be world standard, the economics have not made sense because your monetization is relatively limited and creating up to those standards have always been a challenge. So a lot of local developers have tried to induce local content, but then with not the level of graphics or the design that's really the Indian consumer is expecting. And that's why a lot of the local content is not done well. That said, if you look at television, right? Over the years today, uh, I mean, 90, 95% of content consumed in India is local and locally relevant in terms of culture. And I think as the market opens up, becomes larger, over the next few years, you will see the advent of local content, even in gaming. And by local content, I just don't mean language, but being culturally local will really become very important and become a large uh, driver. So I think a few years down the line, that's going to be a big, big thing in India. And India, you can go as deep as you want, or you can stay as of the surface as you want. If you want, every state is a country in its own. It's got local culture, local language. You can market locally. So I think a lot of that is evolving yet. And we're starting to see games, for example, Ludo King, which has got hundreds of millions of downloads in India, has been on, right on top of the charts for a few years, run by a friend of mine. 
does extremely well. The Indians connect to that. Our own game, World Cricket Championship, we don't spend any money marketing it, but it still has maybe 15, 20 million monthly active users because all of us have grown up with cricket, right? This is one aspect. Second, of course, we already discussed this in terms of how the market is monetizing. And what does the impact of local content have? Is it just more accessibility and so more volume-based pricing, meaning more people enter into the scope or in the ecosystem? And or is there more breadth opportunity? Meaning if I'm a local Indian accessing local Indian content, I have a higher propensity to pay more itself. How do you think about monetization? Is it both of those levers? No, I think it'll be first, it'll be the discoverability and the organic pull of that content, which is locally relevant. And you can draw parallels across many other apps that are doing so well. One company I've invested in, Kuku FM in India, is scaling so well because they've really regionalized audio content very well and has been very successful. So I see that happening in this. But the monetization will not happen unless the game is designed properly for it. So local content plus strong design for monetization would be a good successful recipe. With this many consumers coming online and immersing into gaming at one time, there's another side of the cultural dynamic that's pretty interesting that's less talked about, which is the number of gaming developers in India and native gaming companies has exploded, certainly exploded over the last five years. Talk a little bit more about the talent pool for gaming today and why that dynamic has occurred. We talked a little bit about this propensity of local content and its potential, but give us a sense of what is the actual talent pool for people in India building for gaming today and how has that changed? Over the last decade, I think in the first decade at least of our existence in the 2000s, I would not find really any quality local content for gaming per se because again, like we discussed, gaming had really not been in our culture for the longest period of time. But a lot of the global gaming companies set up back offices in Bangalore and Chennai and places like that whether it's Electronic Arts, Game Loft, Zynga, and I would say trained a lot of talent over here in the decades of 2010 to 2015, 2017. Uh, they got access to participate in the development of global games, manage live ops, understand you know how these games are monetizing. And then a lot of those developers have stepped out and started setting up their own companies. So that's one aspect that's happened. The second is, Parallelly, you had the explosion in the mobile phone revolution, smartphone revolution, data, what Geo did. So you suddenly had a much larger local user base that you could cater to. And third, you've started seeing some success stories, some things that have made headlines. Nazara went was the first gaming company to do an IPO in India, which was quite successful. You've seen some fantastic exits of studios out of India in recent years some local success stories like the Ludo King one I referred to. So I think all of these are also inspiring a lot of entrepreneurs to look at the gaming space and jump into it. With the macro factors, I think there's a lot more equity capital, venture capital, now willing to back gaming entrepreneurs, which again kind of induces people coming in and setting up in this space. So I think you have three or four macro factors coming together to really see this spike. It's an interesting flywheel effect of sorts in some sense as well, right? Because when you have more of a local talent pool and more immersion into the sector, you have higher propensity, at least from a velocity perspective, on creating local content, attracting local users. That creates more of an opportunity to fund businesses that are building for that base, on and on. We talked about this a little bit earlier. You alluded to it in an interesting way, which is your 90 plus year old grandmother still plays games. Gaming is not a homogenous group. When you think of the Indian gamer specifically, which is, I think, a little bit different than Western markets and Chinese markets, it's really not a homogenous group. It's truly pan-India. For folks listening, pan-India means we're talking men, women, old, young. Not many sectors can claim the same. I'm curious if you can break down for us the different archetypes of these gamers I imagine your 90-year-old grandmother is probably not playing the same thing you know, that a 15-year-old boy is playing, obviously. So what are the different archetypes of gamers in India? What are their different characteristics? How should we be understanding you know, who, are the different, you know, who are the different users right, of these services or of these applications in the country? It's across the board. So kids these days get onto their parents' devices, whether it's iPads or phones at a very young age. I'm seeing kids at the age of two and three playing around with it parents' devices, pacifiers. 
I mean, they enjoy it and they just let them use it for some time. Hopefully, they moderate the amount of time they're spending. But the reality is, you can't keep kids away from digital devices completely. That's one very important audience. And we've got a great product, Kidopia, just in that space, which is gamified early learning, healthy entertainment for young kids. That does very well for us. So that's really important. I would say also high impact group to go after because you're filling an important need gap. I think your stereotype gamer boys age of 10 to 25 are pretty active in gaming and they are more into not only playing games with their friends, but also watching games on YouTube, following gaming influencers, etc. Women gamers are also pretty underestimated. I think in India, they're very much into gaming, perhaps a different cohort of games, but yes, very much into it. And I would say underserved to that extent. I'll share an interesting anecdote. You know, a few years back, we were checking stats on our cricket game and we saw that the top 1% was spending several hours a day playing the game. And I actually got concerned looking at the data because I said, if, if these are school or college kids spending six hours playing the game, then parents are not going to be very happy. And, you know, should we consider having some restrictions ourselves in terms of responsible gaming? The last thing I want to do is get kids to fail in the exams. But we actually did a VOC and tried to do a survey to understand who this top 1% was, who was spending 6-7 hours playing a game, playing a cricket game. And we figured, you know, these were potentially, you know, shopkeepers sitting in all parts of India uh, playing fifth five-day test match on a cricket game while serving their customers. So that was a use case for them. They enjoy cricket. They found that as a great pastime. And they kept doing it while sitting in their shop. So it's really across across demographics, as you can see. Yeah. And the implication of that is when you look at the business, right? And I want to spend a little bit of time actually talking about the business. You've structured the business in a way that's representative of all those different pillars in gaming today. So esports, gamified early learning, real money gaming, freemium, telco subscription, ad base, et cetera. At a high level, can you explain not many consumer businesses, I'd say, have that many pillars or that many aspects to either their monetization strategy, their application strategy, et cetera. Can you help us understand a little bit at a higher level, what are the different pillars in the business? How do these interrelate and how are they distinctive as well? Because each strategy also has its own model, its own consumer base, right? And its own place in your own internal stack. Because we started so early in this space, we also learned a few lessons pretty early. And one thing I realized in the gaming space is it's a highly disruptive space. Consumer preferences changing very fast, technology changing very fast. In markets like India, regulatory changes being also happening all the time. So I realized that there would be disruption on an ongoing basis. And I didn't want to build a business that took two steps forward and one step back all the time. I thought I would lose valuable time. And I just felt that if you ran what I like to call a stable ship in a stormy sea, you would, over a period of time, make a lot of progress. And gaming was going to be big in India. I'm, I'm very convinced it's going to be even larger than I anticipated in the next few years. So the one thing I wanted to ensure for Nazara is that it's a very stable company. And one way to do it was to set up multiple pillars of business within the gaming space so that we were not disrupted by one or two things happening in the environment or even within us. That's how conceptually over the last six, seven years, especially we've driven the business. Coming specifically to our business, we run five verticals today. The first one is gamified early learning because that's a space we believe is a high impact space to operate in, give young kids healthy digital entertainment content, which parents also feel the kids are learning something while engaging with the content. That has done very well. We have two flagship products, Kidopia and Animal Jam, and we continue to build that vertical. The esports space, like I was telling you in India, especially is I think a high growth space and I really do believe India will leapfrog the world when it comes to esports over the next two, three years, not even too far out. And we're starting to see fantastic progress there. Today, Zara dominates the esports landscape in India with close to an 80% market share. So that's another vertical that we've been operating in. Running the freemium games, World Cricket Championship, our game, today has 15 to 20 million active users on a monthly basis. And we are launching more products like that. So that becomes a slightly different approach to monetization. The skill-based real money gaming is a highly scaled up business model in India when it comes to gaming or within gaming in terms of relative terms. It's a relatively small business for us today, 5% of our revenues. 
we've taken a slightly conservative approach there because there were a lot of gray areas in terms of regulatory risks, taxation policies, etc. And we wanted to wait for some time before we really scaled up big time in it. Now, I think in 23, we were hoping in 22, there will be more clarity. But I think in 23, we are surely expecting a lot of clarity to emerge. The government of India has also taken a pretty active role in trying to achieve this. So we have our foot in the door in that business. And we are hoping that in this year, we will be able to scale it up. And the last one, interestingly, we got into is the ad tech space because we really saw many overlaps within gaming and ad tech, both on monetization, user acquisition, first party data, etc. That's the fifth vertical we have. So this is how our business is structured. I would say we have diversification across geographies. Today, over 40% of our revenues are coming from the US market, 40% from India and 20% from the rest of the world. We have diversification by business model. So it could be brand sponsorships, it could be media rights, in-app purchases, subscription, etc. real money gaming. So there are at least five or six different ways to monetize within our network and different verticals like you saw. While some people may feel it's a case of over-diversification, but I think if you take a slightly longer view as we are taking, we're very comfortable with what we are building out. Yeah, double-click into that a little bit more, the over-diversification piece, because I think one, there's a balance in operating the business. In one sense, you can say, wow, exactly actually to the point you made, this is going to be a hyper-stable ship in a stormy market. It's built for not being disruptable because there's so many different ways that the business operates. There's another downstream effect, though, of focus. And how do you actually build scale, breadth, whether it's from a talent perspective, whether it's a customer perspective, product perspective, et cetera, when you're in so many different markets, so many different business models, and so many fundamentally different pillars. Like We'll talk a little bit about esports and gamified learning, your two biggest business units. The business models for those are fundamentally different. How do you think about the balance of diversification and building something that's enduring versus focus, velocity, and building something of scale? We approach it through a very different structure, what we call Friends of Nazara, where each of our businesses is operated by founders and management teams independently, which means that we're kind of having best of both worlds, I would say. In our structure, you have diversification, but you also have a lot of focus at each individual unit and we operate them at arm's distance. They have significant autonomy while we bring to them the Nazara DNA, like you like to call it, and infuse and help them with that. The businesses are actually quite independently run and very focused on what they do. So I think our Friends of Nazara structure works very well, at least has been working very well in the last few years. And we have tweaked it over a period of time and hope to double down on that. And what does Friends of Nazara specifically mean? Is that joint ventures? Is that acquisitions? Is it partnerships? Tell us a little bit more about that because you're right, it is a highly unique model. Yeah, so the way we work is we usually acquire majority stakes in businesses that fit in these five verticals I spoke about. And we do it as a mix of primary and secondary with the founders who have been running it for a while. They want some liquidity. They want some more primary capital in their company. But they also believe that in the long run, they can continue to run this business and create a lot more value. So this is one stepping stone for them. So we acquire a majority stake, but we leave a significant stake with the founders. 30-40% stake remains with the core management team. We also give them some stake in Nazara so that they feel part of the larger group and larger platform and also look at the benefit of the overall platform. And that was one of the reasons we also listed our company to make sure that we have an ability to create liquidity for all these founders through the Nazara stakes that we've been giving to them. The second pillar of the Friends of Nazara is where we give them significant autonomy to operate. So we don't really get into day-to-day operations of the business at all. The founders are net. We help them professionalize the teams by bringing in CXOs, setting some better structures. A few things that we focus on is better corporate governance, better reporting, better compliances. Or small things like these now in India are becoming very important as well for sustainability and growth of your business. And of course, we bring our network, our experience, our consumers to them. So this model seems to work well. And then as we grow the business together, we also continuously find ways to provide liquidity to the founders at an incremental level at higher valuations while we understand the business is better. So I think that's the model that really worked well for us and our founders. We've seen several success stories over the last five or six years, at least 
I would say five or six companies which have kind of 10x revenue since we entered. So that's the kind of win-win model we've been operating. This ecosystem model of Friends of Nazara is interesting, especially when layered with how the business model in this space has evolved. I think the historical models, certainly when you think of something like Vast, which we talked about a little bit earlier, was much more B to B to C, right? You had to rely on telcos as the pipe and the distribution arm, and it was one layer removed from the customer. A lot of these newer business models are directly B to C. You're getting much, much closer to the customer itself. When you think of both of these components of A, having a Friends of Nazara type ecosystem, so you have complementary products, complementary services that can take advantage of your platform, but are also distinctly unique. And you think about the trend of the space being more purist B2C versus relying on an intermediary. What impact has this had on the business? I think it's had a very positive impact. Even in the B2B2C that you refer to, you are always very close to running, for example, digital user acquisition. In Azara, we had 15 years of experience doing that. And we were able to replicate a lot of that learning when we entered the direct B2C space to do it correctly. I think gaming in itself, if you have access to the end consumer, you can understand the consumer a lot better and improve and iterate your product a lot better, focus on the key metrics when it comes to retention, etc. You have a lot more data with you and it really allows you to enhance your product, enhance your LTVs, improve your margins and scale your business. And that's what we've seen in products like Kidopia, which has scaled. When we entered Kidopia three and a half years back, it was a 4 million USD ARR business. And along with the team and the founders and the management teams there, in rapid fire in two years, we were able to scale it to $25 million kind of ARR while driving a lot of profitability. So I think a lot of our strengths that we developed over a period of time actually have come into play in the D2C in a much better manner. Talk a little bit more about this balancing of monetization and growth, especially when they're at odds with one another. There's this established logic in the West, especially in consumer businesses, accelerate growth, capture market share, and then turn on monetization dials. There's a couple elements of that that are unique to India. So A is that works well when it's established that users will pay. That could be especially risky in India. B, it's much more of a venture-backed business model. One of the unique things about Nazara is you guys have reached scale. You've obviously gone public now, but it's one of the bootstrap success stories in India. I have to imagine when you were earlier alluding to the DNA that friends of Nazara companies get when they come into the Nazara ecosystem, part of that DNA is a focus on profitability and actual sustainable margins versus just growth at all costs. So maybe you can talk a little bit more about in a fast growth market that's consumer bent and highly disruptive, how do you think about this balance of monetization versus user growth? Sure. So I think balance between monetization and profitability, right, is my favorite question because I get asked by analysts all day long on exactly the same topic and answer while sleeping. I think for us, we have a particular DNA that's evolved over two decades. And it may be the right DNA for certain businesses. It may not be the right DNA for certain businesses. But our DNA very much is to drive profitable growth, as I like to call it. While even today at Nazara, we are prioritizing growth over profitability. What we usually don't like to do or we get a bit uncomfortable with is if the growth is fueled with a lot of cash burn. And like you said, in certain businesses to acquire market share and leadership, that may be important. But it comes with its own risk of ability to retain consumers and then monetize at a later stage in new markets like India where it's you know, monetization still evolving. So we've kind of tried to stay away from such businesses. Our thought process is very clear. We will always prioritize growth for scale while remaining profitable. If it's a strategic business for us, for example, the esports business where we are a market leader and we want to make sure we maintain a market leadership or extend the lead that we have, create enough modes, we may operate that business at a very low margin or even break even. But we usually try and put a guardrail to avoid getting into losses. And a diversified business allows us to generate cash and profits from other businesses that we are operating. So the way we look at it at any year or three-year perspective, there may be some businesses that we will have a strategic focus and there'll be some businesses that we will treat as a cash cow to, on an overall basis, ensure that Azara continues to drive positive profitability and positive cash flows. I think that's how we've built the business. 
just to clarify, you know, we did raise venture capital because you mentioned Bootstrap. We did raise three million dollars of venture capital from Westfish Capital in two thousand five. That's the all we lay, raised for the next fifteen years. We actually ran our business quite profitably, and I remember around twenty thirteen, twenty fourteen, we were sitting on about thirty million dollars of cash, all crude from our own profitability, which we then redeployed to expand our friends of uh, Nazara Network. So while we did raise some venture capital, largely you are right, we've operated like a bootstrap company. When you think about increased monetization for the sector at large, and we look ahead, where do the profit pools emerge from? Is it just deeper expansion within the customer wallet itself? We talked a little bit earlier about the propensity of local content, more discoverability, more accessibility, et cetera. Is it expansion within the customer wallet itself, or do we start to just see more tangential revenue streams, whether it's ad-based, IP-based? I think there's a lot of potential in the core customer monetization or core product monetization rather than tangential monetization. I think there's a lot of work to be done there, starting with much better game design. I think even we as an Indian game developer are still getting there in terms of game design, which will monetize. But I think Indian consumer is willing to spend but he really needs a reason to spend. He'll not just throw his money. Therefore, the game has to be compelling enough to make him spend that money and designed correctly to make him spend that money. So at least for us as a company, a lot of focus in terms of growth is going to come from there. And to ensure that our products are engaging enough, have long-term retention. Because without that, you'll be running on a treadmill with LTV CACs not really matching up. You've said that a few times in the discussion that the games have to be designed in a way that makes sense for the Indian consumer, especially when we're thinking about monetization, what does that mean? It's unique what you just said. Actually, most founders of Indian businesses, the bias is not that the Indian consumer will pay. We just need to meet them there. Certainly for something like SaaS, the bias is we need to go to the profit pool that actually exists because the vast majority of the Indian consumer will not pay. So your belief is the Indian consumer will pay, but you have mentioned this a couple of times today, right? That the design needs to be better. What does that mean? I come from an era when there was no monetization and Indian consumers were not paying anything, right? So we've seen it evolve. And therefore, we don't really come in with that mindset that Indian consumer will not pay. The Indian consumer is very discerning on what he will pay and why he will pay. Let's take again an example of World Cricket Championship, which is our cricket game. It's a fantastic game when it comes to simulation. It's as realistic as you can get. We have a 100-member team in Chennai that's just have been developing this game for seven years. So there's the physics, etc. And we see that in our retention numbers. The retention numbers for the game are fantastic. However, the design of the game is not enough at the right place to invoke the desire of the consumer to actually spend money. It can be a great game. It can have great retention. Consumers enjoying playing the game. But because of your balancing of the economy of your game, you may not really need to spend money to enjoy it more. Putting those right hooks at the right place at the right time, designing it correctly and also marketing it to the consumer correctly, where he feels he's getting value for it, is something that can exponentially see the conversion rates go up. All I was saying was at least I found in our own studios that some of those design skills have been missing. We have improved a lot. It's not that it's not improving. Just in our own cricket game, I think over the last three years, with a lot of work done, we've A-text the conversion rates on in-app purchases. But they're still not good enough when I look at some of the global games that, you know, monetize better in India. There's a carom game that's monetizing better, right? There should be no reason that that's happening compared to a cricket game in India. That's the only small point I'm trying to make. Makes sense. And it comes, I think, with the maturity of the ecosystem. As a final question, if in 10 years we look back and India has achieved its potential for gaming, I'm curious from your perspective, what does that look like? And then I'm equally curious on the flip side of that question. If it hasn't reached its potential for gaming, what will have gone wrong? So I think India would, if it would have reached its potential for gaming in 10 years, and 10 years is a long time in the space we operate, it should be the number one or number two market in the world by monetization, not just in terms of number of game downloads. I think we are already number one or number two in terms of games downloaded on mobile phones. In 10 years' time, I'd love to see India on number one in terms of absolute monetization that's happening on gaming. So I think that would be a great place to be. The so second thing I'd love to see is Indian developers dominating gaming globally. I think there's huge potential there. 
few people have asked me what's your wish list for the budget. I think anyway, the government can also support and incentivize Indian developers to export games globally. It's fantastic. And we're already starting to see some cases of success. I think this can really accelerate. We have a lot of talent which can really deliver globally. So I think Indian game developers dominating global markets on the gaming side, topping the charts would be a fantastic place to be. From a Nazara perspective, I think in 10 years' time, if you are not doing 20, 25,000 crores of revenues, you would have underplayed our opportunity from where we are today. So I think huge growth potential and we'd love to get there. I think one important thing is how is this market regulated? How is it taxed? Is it fair? Is it balanced? Is it incentivized well? The government also has an important role to play to make this into a large industry. I am very hopeful also with recent actions that have happened in the last year or two that the right positive approach is being taken. So I think clarity on a lot of fronts, the faster it emerges, the stronger foundation will be laid for this industry in our country. And the longer it takes and the longer time you operate in unclarity, in gray areas, etc., that could have an unfortunate negative impact on the growth potential of the industry. That's one important aspect that I'm very hopeful we will go down the right path. One of this, this was great. I appreciate you taking the time to, to walk us through on the Indian gaming sector. And especially for those listening in the West, 20 to 25,000 crore is a, is a high ticket aspiration as well. It translates to two to $3 billion in US revenue, which underscores not only the position of Nazar and the Indian gaming ecosystem, but how exciting of a growth market and opportunity it is. So it's going to be fun to watch that story from afar. We'll have to have you back on in the midst of that journey to talk a little bit more about the evolution, but appreciate the time today and thanks for all the insights. Thank you. My pleasure. To keep learning about the topics discussed, head to joincolossus.com where you'll find our curated list of resources, a transcript for this episode, and a library of conversations on investing and business. That's J-O-I-N-C-O-L-O-S-S-U-S dot com. Mm-hmm.